The world of talent management is, uh, as you know, a very, very broad subject. Uh, so we try to crystallize, try and define, try and narrow the subject uh, to high potentials, uh, specifically how to identify, uh, assess potential, and how do you develop potential. With that, coming to the panelists uh, representing industry, we have uh, Mr. M.T. Lakshmanan, who is the head of talent management and corporate human resources at uh, Last Minute Two Group. Our consulting expert is Mr. Ryan Lowe, who is partner of People Advisory Services at Ernst & Young LLP. We have uh, academia being represented by Dr. R.K. Prem Rajan, who is Professor of Organizational Behavior uh, Area at XLRI Jamshedpur. And Professor is not with us physically, but we are leveraging technology and he is going to be joining us uh, through Skype. Very vibrant and young network. Uh, the membership fees are flashed there. Uh, and I, I would just want to state the point that uh, HR is at a very exciting phase in its evolution, uh, especially in our, in our country. A lot of smart young professionals, so much to learn, so much to share. Uh, this is one platform for all of us to get together, uh, contribute, learn from each other. Uh, and I think exciting times. Uh, learned a lot uh, personally through this network and I would encourage you, uh, we have Mr. Santosh Narkani sitting outside, uh, to go pay him a visit and, and try out uh, uh, this membership. Uh, I'm sure there's lots to gain and very little uh, pain in the entire process. Uh, coming to the master class, uh, what we're trying to do here is get a good mix of industry, uh, practitioners, people from the world of consulting, from academia, getting all of these people together. Uh, and uh, uh, the dynamic moderator for this evening is uh, a person whose knowledge towards all of us, not just uh, you know through his knowledge, but quite physically. Vikram Vector, I think Vikram is all of 70. But that's that's interesting to uh, fire the first set of questions to actually uh, the person who is the farthest away from us, but the most not noticeable. Uh, so starting with you, uh, Dr. Prem, my question is really in your experience and you really uh, have dealt with a lot of us, maybe taught uh, many of us in this classroom uh, here, uh, when you look at high potentials, uh, what, what are, who are high potentials and how do you identify them? So uh, the way we understand the high potential would mean ability to do justice to positions that are at least two to three levels higher than the current position. I think that would be a, a, a kind of a brief manner in which one can look at a high potential. I'm going to keep relying on my own experience as I speak. And to me, a high potential is somebody who is visible, who makes himself visible. He walks into the room and you know that he is high potential. Every top leader who has gone on to be the CEO, CXO of companies are people who when you looked at them 5, 7, 8, 10 years earlier, you knew this guy is going to be there. You know, you knew this guy is going to be and he is going to be significantly different than the rest. And that's why he will go where he will go. I would tend to agree with that. But in typical consulting style, I look at three A's. Okay? So I would say it is the ability the agility and the aspiration, really to go far in an organization. And again, it is visible. You know, it is something that you can really see, there's a spark in such people that, that you can see when you come into the room. Frameworks are similar, you know, I think the term terminology might be different. So, for example, we look at a uh, four-factor, uh, you know, analysis on people. Uh, the first one is called JARL, so the first one is judgment. You know, for a large company like Reliance, I think if people cannot take decisions, we look for people who can go up to levels who can take decisions, and not people who will push up uh, or, or upwardly delegate decisions. I think they use different words, but achievement, ability, the drive, the need to go on and do the next thing. Uh, relationships, I think uh, while all of us believe that everything is about process, but still, you know, imagine if you had all had to do this uh, meeting uh, virtually, I don't think we'll build any of the networks or relationships. So again, R is important and the last one, I don't think I'll talk a lot about, but learning agility. Can virtual assessment centers replace the traditional ones? I think that uh, given a choice, there is nothing like going the traditional route and having a, an in-person assessment process. 
because the type of nuances that you can pick up, that the, that the assessors can pick up while going through such a process, in my view are unparalleled. A lot of it can be mimicked through a virtual environment. You can build in certain other interactive elements by people calling in during the course of the center. You know, it could be an individual and his or her computer, but an assessor calling in, live feeds on the email, etc. So all of that can be done. But I, my, my, my own belief is that it would uh, still uh, be a much more effective process if you were to do it uh, face to face. Uh, I, I, I would tend to think uh, there would be a lot of uh, uh, opportunity where we now. Virtual assessment would try and replace the traditional assessment center. However, there are certain types of exercises which uh, it will take a little difficult for virtual assessment center to make. Very clear, maybe uh, the higher you go in the organization, the more risky it becomes to just use a virtual assessment center. That seems to be the key uh, learning here. How the old tools, 16PF, etc., compared to the new ones like Hogan, etc., and more importantly, the question is what separates a good tool from a great tool? Uh, the traditional uh, psychological test, they are constructed not so much keeping in mind the contemporary use of this instrument in terms of its ability to measure hypertension, so on and so forth. Fine, so we can look at this as today this test, which has uh, uh, increasingly becoming popular, such as Hogan uh, or uh, uh, some of the other uh, popular tests like OPQ, so on and so forth. So they are specifically uh, developed, keeping in mind these kind of applications, software applications, so on and so forth. Another thing uh, I told that would be in terms of its uh, validity. When you look at the uh, validity, uh, certainly uh, something like a privacy validity would be very high or a uh, good. Uh, so I think the other uh, question around the assessment is uh, really around how early uh, can potential be identified? Suppose a person has joined uh, recently your organization, how early do you think a potential can be identified after a person is hired? 50% uh, of the people uh, Generally, most organizations are categorized based on the performance of the job and are not really uh, potential, especially line managers with very little uh, knowledge uh, about uh, you know, the ability to perform the future, next higher, next higher role. And they are a good time to, uh, to put people through a potential assessment will be at least one year after the person has been able to settle down in a job and be able to perform. You know, I think informally we start assessing people on potential as soon as they come. You know, there is this uh, inherent, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, trait in all of us where we try and slot people. Right? So we've got 10 people joining us uh, as a fresh group and immediately we say that I think these two or three people are, you know, going to make it big. I think earliest one year, my sense is Four, four years probably into the job is when you start, uh, you know, identifying really some of the hypos in a more formal manner. And of course, this is probably true for organizations that uh, that are well established, mature, etc. People, sometime back, at least a couple of years ago, there used to be this notion that two performance cycles and two bosses. You know? So that was the notion that you know the person has consistently performed twice. It's not a flash in the pan from a performance perspective and two people have observed which means you have that much more validity. Uh, do you kind of agree with that two by two recommendation? I think it, it certainly makes sense. I would still like to put it as uh, you know probably two bosses certainly. So you know probably for performance like that. The question is uh, which is a better predictor of success IQ or EQ? Uh, 
we need to move quickly and cover some of the developmental aspects. So the question here, which is I think a very interesting question is, we are all uh, moving into, you know, of course instant noodles are banned, but instant development is not. So I think, uh, are there some new models on faster ways of developing iPods internally? So clients today are actually coming and telling us that, okay, how can you help us develop people on ensuring that they are able to, de to deliver better outcomes to the firm in a one year period? So it's more about very focused development interventions, understand the role the, uh, the, the employee or the iPod is into today, understand what is it that will make a difference to, to getting to that outcome and then putting in place certain interventions that are focused around a three to six month period wherein you try and you know up the employee. Something fairly new that we've been hearing which is to say that okay how do we do things quickly, how do we get impact on the ground and more ROI out of our development efforts. I think yes you can have modules to deliver training programs, modules to deliver training development. Uh, uh, as they see, it takes a pass to the water, uh, but at the end of it, the pass has to be taken. At the end of it, the individual has to invite everything. And there, I think, I, I haven't found the standard such a problem. When we look at organizations uh, putting a lot of money on the high potentials, right? and the high potential guys of the entire landline, like, they get a lot of learnings, they get a lot of new projects to work on. Is the organization not doing injustice to all the other people who are not probably the same kind of opportunities to grow themselves? We don't live in a socialist world anymore. <laughs> okay? And I think given the war for talent that is there, we do need to place our bets. And, and also we don't have enough of unlimited resources that we can we can spread around, you know, developing everyone. So yes, there is a certain amount of development that is targeted at, you know, the, the, the general, the, the significant contributors. But there, there will always, in my view, need to be that differential focus on iPods or whatever you want to call it, a smaller section of your uh, population who is going to give you that, you know, that, that steep vertical growth. Uh, talking about LMD. I have high performers who go through a potential assessment, some of them clear the assessment, they become part of the corporate pool, corporate budget, and there's a significant amount of uh, leadership development programs that they conducted, they think it like stars, they get significant visibility, they are king. But the rest of the people go back to my various businesses and there they are going through another development program with them. They will again come back to the assessment center maybe after a year, maybe after two years. So, uh, uh, to my mind, large conglomerates still have a sizable budget and still are willing to invest. The question in my mind is, are people willing to invest their own time to go through the development process, especially in large organizations? Sir, I really want to know the validity of uh, assessment center for recognizing the high potentials of the company. At the end of the day, it's uh, a true picture or a true uh, situation is not presented in front of a candidate. So how do you really understand that that particular candidate is the right fit and is the right a high potential of a company? See, I think that there are uh, multiple tools that you can use, of which I think it's 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 proven, it's it's uh, you know with data that the validity of an assessment center is somewhere around 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So if you look at uh, what an assessment center does, uh, as you rightly said, it comes to as close a simulation of a real life uh, situation as is possible. You've got uh, a set, uh, you, you put the individual through a multitude of tools and situations that mimic the challenges that he or she would face as part of their, you know, real jobs. So there is a mix of individual exercises which test analytical ability, there is a mix of group exercises, there are, you know, role plays with customers, employees, etc. Now, no taking away from the fact that none of this is real, but it is as close to real as you can get to in, in such an environment. But I also think that over the, over the if you design it right and if, over the period of a day, I think it's very difficult for an individual to fake through it. That's why your design builds in certain 
uh, redundancies of sorts, you know, so the same competency is being tested by different tools, etc. So again, you are trying to minimize some of the issues that you spoke about, but it's not fully enough. So you are typically trying to design an assessment center and put some instruments in place, some psychometrics. What would be the purpose of those instruments? What would we try and get them to tell you about the person over and about these kinds of simulations that you have? Uh, it's about, uh, so again, depending on the competency model and the, and the, and the level of, uh, the level at which we are running the assessments, I would probably say that uh, the psychometric gives you some view about the, what any psychometric will do, you know, the, the predispositions of the individual in, in, uh, in a work environment. And then what you can do through the, through the assessment center through the other exercises of the assessment center, also to look at what sort of uh, alignment there is between what has come out of the psychometric, which is a self-assessment at the end of the day, and what is observed in terms of observable behaviors through the other, uh, you know. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, once we assess our hypothesis, and uh, we know that these are the set of people who are hypothesis, so what if they start with writing? What are the ways and means in which we can maintain that? And let me add one question to it, which is the favorite one. Should we tell them? Uh, from an LNG perspective, it works outstandingly well. I looked at my attrition metrics and top performance. It's almost zero. And uh, that is possible because of the way we have aligned a whole host of connections once you are a top performer, obviously we will communicate to them that you are a top performer, one. But he knows it because he is getting visibility, because he is getting nominated to his GAT program, or he is getting nominated to some Harvard, or he is getting nominated to some other program. the director is in town, he's called, and a few people are called, <coughs> so, so he knows, he knows he is a top performer. I think a lot of question, uh, clients ask me this question, you know, so, what if I develop my people and they leave? And I think the answer that I always give them is, what if you don't and they stay? You know, so you're left with a bunch of fairly average people with, yeah, some of them may still shine, but a lot of them will not. There are three principles. Whenever there is high attrition and high potential and high performance, three things, one of the three things are broken. One is either the compensation is not really hugely different, which means there is a marginal difference and that's the point which lacks alluded to. Second is the accelerated growth, if you haven't given two, you, you've seen a person as she has the potential for two jumps, but you are hesitant to give them two jumps, means that process is broken, really there is no accelerated growth. And the third obviously is learning opportunities, visibility opportunities, so one of those three is certainly missing wherever the ambition is high. Hypo can be, this hypo exercise can be done without assessment center. That's right. Second is, this level of uh, implied, according to your experience, call it hypo exercise. It's a middle level, junior level, or senior level, whatever, you know, the way you want to break up. Uh, from a, can you do, uh, can you identify high potential without an assessment center? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And, uh, so it's generally industry specific, I would say. And uh, if you're working for a manufacturing company, in general, looking for identifying people with at least five to twelve years of domain experience, five to twelve years, five to twelve years range. If somebody's got a domain experience in the in that particular manufacturing process, that's where you would start. But if you're looking at the uh, IT industry or if you're looking at the uh, new age, uh, then you're looking at much you know, much lesser experience. You are not looking at too much of your pain. And uh, so you will look at it with uh, at least one year, that's what he said earlier. And maybe two to three years of experience before you become a uh, What are some of the best practices that you have seen uh, where companies uh, link sort of assessment centers and then take it up to succession planning and some of the other processes? Yes, so I think the it's very important that the entire process gets integrated. So you start, of course, with your identification of your critical roles. And what we've seen 
a lot of organizations now doing is preparing success profiles for those specific roles. So what are those competencies that are required for that specific role and what's it going to and you know then basis that success profile do very targeted assessments at people at the next level who either next level or two levels down who they think will fit those profiles. So there is one level of a judgment call I'll say that happens you know to identify the talent pool for those roles but then the assessment process is very very customized to those success profiles. First identify gaps and then build the development process which could even be things like uh, job locations and or, or an action learning project but that's action learning projects generally happen to be lower down in the hierarchy. Uh, at that level, it's typically uh, some sort of sensitization. In some cases, some uh, some coaching, executive coaching as well, that is given to accelerate the development of that. Uh, uh, as uh, I doing a hypo identification without an assessment, so can one of you throw a little more light on how we could do about that? And uh, second thing is, I'm talking from a small company perspective. Most of you are looking to huge organizations um, with a low attrition. So even if we do identify high potential individuals, um, how can we face the challenge of offering them a growth pattern or you know, how, how do we channelize them, keep them focused in the organization because we may not have positions for all of them? Uh, I would say tell them, but, uh, but it depends. The answer is it depends. It depends on the company, it depends on the sector, it depends on your own company culture. So a whole host of other things gets into it. Theoretically answer in today's world, I'll say tell them. But also remember to tell them that this is not a permanent visa. <laughs> it's a Schengen visa for one year <laughs> and it might be re-validated next year. Your first question, uh, most cases, and I think Lax alluded to that earlier, that 60% of the companies still today look at performance as a surrogate of potential. And uh, therefore, and nothing wrong with that. Because if you, you know, remember, and I, this is my favorite, uh, Sachin Tendulkar and Vinod Kamli at one point in time had the same potential, same potential. And yet today, uh, we know the difference. One came through a solid performance route, uh, the other had strong potential, but somewhere along the lines this fell by the side. So I think uh, performance still continues to be strong, uh, you know, so you can do measurement of uh, potential through a solid performance. Basically, you know, what many organizations do through the talent review forum. So bring in the performance, which is through your performance management system, and then a group of senior leaders get together and, and discuss each of these individuals. So differing points of view are put forward. Some organizations can do, can, can bring other data like a psychometric or a 360, but it's not necessary for the talent review forum to, to take cognizance of that data. In that situation, I have a lot of high potential guys, but my business is not growing. Um, so my, my my wage bill is increasing, my margins are getting eroded because I'm, re because if I'm going to retail them, I'm going to be paying them more. And uh, can I afford is the question. So I think you have to find a sweet spot where the number of high potentials you've identified are people to whom you can develop and give them higher roles. And if you can't, then uh, you're going to lose them. You know, one is really clearly what lacks is saying. Remember, what does McKenzie do? They make a virtue out of the fact that you have know, given away, gifted so many CEOs to the industry. What does levers do? So it's the leadership factory. So for all you know, you might have a potential of being being that for your industry. The path is really through volunteerism. Today we find you know, in fact, my experiences working with Deloitte was when you're not able to give a lot of leadership experiences to people within, you know, you were able to give them outside. When you're doing CSR projects, you I find in fact many people take on hugely challenging roles when you're doing a lot of voluntary activity in, in service of the community, in service of other things. That's the second opportunity. The third is at any point uh, each of our companies is struggling with some fire or the other which is keeping the CEO away. Many times I've just put the EC together, the MD and the EC together saying, hey, what are you struggling with? Can these high potentials do something for you, work with you especially on these special projects? Perhaps any one of some of those people. Are the high performers the high potentials for the organization or how do you differentiate between the high performers and the high potentials? 
especially people in your in teams that have very very high performers, but they are they are great performers at that level. And the moment they get put into a, the next level role, they tend to uh, somehow not uh, demonstrate that that level of performance. So that's where the difference can actually come into play, you know, in the, between performance and potential. And yes, you can help prepare for those new roles by helping build some of those competencies. But it's not always, you know, the same the same thing, performance and, and potential. And you find this a lot in sales. So great sales guys doing a great individual contributor role. The moment they're put into the next level where they have to manage a team and not do things they were doing earlier, it becomes a challenge. Because they're so used to you, you heard the, the phrase, right? What got you here won't get you there. So I think that's really where uh, this, is, this, this discussion is coming from. When you hire people in the organization, so should we hire on the basis of potential or competence? We all know that uh, you know, there is no course even in HR which teaches you how to do interviews. We all know HR strategy but we are never taught how to interview, we are never taught how to, we are certainly taught assessment so I think uh, when you look at the MBA curriculum or you know there is more futuristic kind of work but uh, even a course on Excel, how to do an Excel spreadsheet and calculate you know a, a few things on if you are going to work in compensation you will never really taught, you learn the job. So therefore, to answer your question, I would rely on my own company systems to train you, but certainly uh, higher for potential. You know, maybe, uh, I think one of you could tell us the typical uh, definition, the lay definition of fitment, readiness, potential, how do we differentiate these, and how do we ensure that uh, this movement can be made seamless without attracting employees? Assessing readiness is, is a tough one. I think, uh, as you said, you know, you do the potential assessment. You say that okay, this person is uh, three years, ready in three years, ready in two years, whatever it is. I think the the, the key. I, I'm not still not sure how you get to that uh, answer first of all. But once you do that, I think the next uh, part, which is incumbent on the HR team, is to ensure that the person actually is ready in in that time period. So I think charting out that journey, if the planning is done right, then that journey will also culminate in that person actually taking over that specific role. So I think as long as you show that journey to the to the individual and and that then gets culminated into actual, uh, you know, actually doing what was promised, I, I don't think that should be a problem. Uh, we are far more willing to accept uh, and even sometimes get enamored by a candidate from outside but uh, to our internal candidates we want the person to be absolutely yes. ready that absolute readiness uh, doesn't happen and uh, so I think that it is a challenge so I think the biggest lot for talent is right now uh, being caught on the campus uh, how many of you returned empty handed from campus summer training this year. through the summer training process uh, be candid you had targets of X but you came back with X minus yeah, so, so some of us so, are, are, so why? So the challenge really is startups and I think that's really where uh, startups are willing to give people a position even when the person is half ready. The challenge for large corporations is, you know, please don't wait for the full ripeness of the person to place him or her into that role because, you know, otherwise a large part of this challenge will, is continuing to move towards startups for that very reason. They're getting challenging roles early on. And I think that's really a large uh, call to action for us in large corporations and in not even so large corporations because startups really are providing that little energy for people to come and experience uh, action at an early stage.